Forum Borealis Paradigm Expansion Greetings from the North, citizens of Earth. Welcome to a fresh episode of Forum Borealis, where we will examine the four most prevalent antisocial personality disorders, like uh, what happens when they meet in a bar. They are NPD or narcissism, BPD or borderline, psychopathy and sociopathy. What are the differences and similarities? Are causations nature or nurture? How do they manifest and how many are actually suffering from it? These and other considerations will be dealt with by our guest tonight, who is a genuine alienist or forensic psychologist as they are known today. Dr. Joni Elizabeth Johnston is a licensed clinical and forensic psychologist, licensed private investigator, CEO, professor, author and podcaster. Hailing from Alabama, she studied at Auburn University where she graduated in 81 with a BA in psychology and then moved on to Florida Institute of Technology where she earned an MS degree and a PsyD or doctorate in clinical psychology in 85. In the professional field, she was a clinical neuropsychology intern in 84 to 85 at Westside VA Medical Center in Chicago, conducting neurological research. From 85 to 87, she was staff psychologist at the Dallas Child Guidance Clinic, working with individuals and families. In 87, she started her own private practice, which lasted a decade. In 91, she founded Work Relationships, a company offering training and consulting, specializing in workplace mental health as well as employee conduct issues, where she currently serves as president and CEO. Between 13 and 15, she worked for R.J. Donovan Correctional Institution as a forensic psychologist on their assessment and crisis unit. From 15, she has worked as a MDO evaluator for the California Board of Parole Hearings. In the educational field, Dr. Johnston has taught general undergraduate psychology courses as an associate professor at Hawthorne College in 84. Between 92 and 96, she was adjunct psychology professor at the University of Texas in Dallas. Between 08 and 12, she was adjunct professor at Tiffin University in Ohio. Between 11 and 13, she was adjunct professor at Argosy University in Atlanta. Other tasks in her career has been expert consultant for Time magazine, the Bureau of National Affairs, Shape and EAP services of New Zealand. She conducted medical reviews for Unimed Direct and National Medical Reviews Incorporated, served as supervisor in the APA-approved clinical psychology internship program, being certified as an EEO complaints investigator, personally trained over 5,000 managers and employees on work-related matters. Her main field, though, has been in forensic psychology evaluations, which she has done since 87, accumulating experience in both the civil and criminal forensic field, conducted court-ordered evaluations and provided forensic evaluations, case evaluations, witness preparations, assistance with cross-examination of mental health experts and mock juries, being a consulting expert and expert witness for courts and conducted criminal forensic evaluations for the Superior Court of San Diego and violence risk assessments for the California Board of Parole. As a professional conference presenter, Joni Johnson has spoken at American Psychological Association, North American Congress of EAP Professionals, 
la Jola Bar Association, Orange County Bar Association, Employment Law Group, Texas Employment Law Seminar, Texas Advanced Law Symposium, Texas Society for Human Resources, Southwest Association of Episcopal Schools Annual Convention, Clemson University Professional Women's Conference, Hospitality Human Resource Association, Texas Psychological Association and South Texas College of Law. She's a member of American Society of Trial Consultants, American Bar Association, National Speakers Association, National Association of Radio Talk Show Hosts, American Medical Association Health Reporters, APA, Media Referral Service, and is former program chair and board member of Media Psychology Division of the American Psychological Association. She has received many awards and listings like the San Diego Psychological Association Media Award, FITS Alumnia of the Year in 99, elected for American Psychological Association Film Committee, Who's Who in the World, Women of the Year in 96, nominated for President's Leadership Program, the Psy Chi National Honorary in Psychology, Career Woman Editorial Advisory Board, and the Girl Scout Auxiliary Advisory Board. Her media work is noteworthy. She is a former columnist for Women's World, Career Women, HR.com, and Lexus Nexus. She's author of articles published in business and legal magazines, including The Verdict, The Orange Company, County Bar Association, the North County Bar Association, La Jolla County Bar Association, EAP Digest, EA Magazine, San Diego Bar Association, and the Texas Employment Law Newsletter. She has been a contributing writer for True Crime Case Files Magazine, runs her own blog called The Psychology of Crime, and is author of the popular law and crime blog The Human Equation at Psychology Today, which has been viewed over three million times. She also is a consultant on true crime shows. Between 94 and 96, she was host and producer for Mental Health Matters. Between 97 and 2000, was host and executive producer for the TV show called State of Mind, is co-host of the forensic radio show Thread of Evidence, and host and producer of the true crime YouTube channel, Unmasking a Murderer. And finally, we have to mention Joni's excellent books. A Parent's Obsession, Learning to Love the Way You Look, from 94. The Complete Idiot's Guide to Psychology, from 99, now in its fourth edition. And The Complete Idiot's Guide to Controlling Anxiety, from 06. And at at this very moment, she is completing her new book on serial killers, which probably is out by the time you hear this. She lives in San Diego with her family, of which husband actually is a friend of our show, host of the wonderful podcast Skeptical, Alex Tsakiris. But we won't use that against her. Now the court is in session, so let's hear what our expert witness thinks the ASPDs indeed would do in a bar. Welcome to Forum Borealis, Joni. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you on. Now, um, I've been wanting for a very long time to shed some light on the topic today. Because you hear this notion thrown everywhere. I mean, not just professionally or on TV or something, but e- even among people. Oh, my ex is a narcissist. Oh, he's a psychopath. Oh, that's so sociopathic. <laughs> yeah. And it's bugging me because uh, I haven't managed to get some clear... It, it seems to me that definitions are fluctuating, not just between professionals, but even from country to country. And today, I'm hoping to nail some definitions. Okay. I'm hoping to pick your brain from not just theoretical but even practical experience with how these mental illnesses however you want to define it manifests okay and also to draw some uh, bigger lines from that but but we'll we'll cross those bridges when we get there so uh, can you relate to to this little complaint of mine 100 percent. as a matter of fact i think the social media and the internet is a, both a blessing and a curse when it comes to psychology. I think the blessing obviously is that we're so much more aware of all of these terms and these disorders and these illnesses. And the curse, I think, is that 
the terms become overused and they also become misused. And I've heard, you know, narcissistic personality disorder used to describe everybody from an ex-boyfriend who really made me mad all the way to somebody who clinically probably fits that definition. So I think the hard part of it is sorting out, okay, what are we talking about? Are we just talking about a personality trait or somebody we don't like? Or are we talking about a real disorder? Exactly. And I also wonder, is it like it's very popular now for many diagnosis is to talk about the specter even autism is a specter now so so that's a thing i want to uh, uh, get to too okay. but let's start uh, first things first um if you had a gun to your head and you had to define uh, the differences or, or maybe also the similarities between and i've, I've chosen four terms that I okay. think is related and I have seen in action and that's BPD uh, and psychopathy which I've, I've one psychologist told me that they've stopped using it that's in this country but psychopathy BPD sociopathy and narcissism yeah what's the difference what's the similarities what are these well, the similarities are, at least here in the United States, that those are, all four of those are classified as what we call personality disorders. Mm. And personality disorders are really different fundamentally from a lot of the diagnoses we think of as severe mental illnesses like a schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or major depression. And because a personality disorder, a person is oftentimes functioning you don't necessarily notice they have something that's wrong at the beginning, but they involve long-term patterns of thinking and behaving that go across all levels of that person's life. So they interfere with work or relationships or whatever, and they are unhealthy and they're inflexible. And so they're basically oftentimes ways people start coping with different issues in their life. It could be trauma. It could be a lot of other things. And they kind of almost get stuck and those with those patterns that and over time they become very problematic for them but also particularly when you're talking about the ones that you outlined for other people mm -hmm. which is why i think we sometimes see people kind of go we call people names like narcissistic or psychopathic or whatever because you know if you look at if you if you were to like crudely divide different diagnoses into pain creators for that for the person who has them versus pain creators for other people mm. most people would say personality disorders in general are more likely to cause pain for other people who are around them of course the reality is al that oh. personality disorders also cause discomfort for the people who have them yeah i mean they, they, they can't be a happy psychopath <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> you know exactly but yeah. there can be by definition, a remorseless psychopath yeah. or a guiltless psychopath. Absolutely, yeah. So somebody who is not as burdened by some of the, you know, feelings or um, values that a lot of us have that keep us from doing things that get us in trouble. Mm. So, so let's start with psychopathy then. It, it, on the face of it, it just means uh, illness of the psyche. Uh, like psyche and pathy is like pathology, right? So exactly. it doesn't really say so much. And people have uh, imaginations from everything. Yeah, from your ex to like a horror movie bad guy. So right. <laughs> how, how is it uh, now common to – do they use the term psychopathy professionally or is it just colloquially? Well, yes and no. So in forensic psychology, which is my area – is often used as part of a risk assessment. So mm. if somebody is getting ready to get out of prison, for example, and you're looking at violence risk, it's not uncommon for that person to receive um, the psychopathy checklist to see because there is some correlation. That doesn't mean causation, but there's some correlation mm. between psychopathy and violence. So in the forensic arena, that term is often used if you look at our DSM-5, which I'm sure you know is kind of our Bible yeah. of psychiatric diagnoses in the United States, it's not listed by itself as a mm. disorder. So it's mm. kind of tricky. Mm. Just in the DSM-5, it was in, what you have now is antisocial personality disorder with 
psychopathy or without psychopathy. So somebody can have antisocial personality disorder, but not be a psychopath. Hmm. Um, so it, it does kind of get to be very kind of confusing. It's interesting that you were talking about the kind of disorder of the psyche, because I really like this term that was kind of thrown around in the 1800s. The, one of the first recognitions of what we call psychopathy today, hmm. the term that was used was moral insanity. Yeah, that says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It really, really does. And so, you know, for hundreds of years, there has been some recognition. I, and I imagine that's across cultures of individuals who, for whatever reason, we didn't know. And to some extent, we still don't know, although we have some clues. Yeah. There seem to be a small subset of people who, again, outwardly appear to be normal or intellectually unimpaired. And yet just seem to behave in a way that went against not only behave in a way, but didn't seem to have some of the, um, of the feelings that most people do. Mm. Um, and so today when we look at psychopathy and try to define it, there's kind of a list of 20 different traits that we use or behaviors that we use to evaluate somebody to see if they would fall in that category. Now, of course the challenge is you and I know, Alice, that, these diagnoses are these neat little boxes for people, right? But people don't always fit. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's what we call um, uh, hallmarks. Is that what you call it? Like you stamp someone, bam, here's the category. Exactly. Label. And, you know, and it's important to realize that the, the whole idea of diagnosing initially was for treatment purposes. Mm. It wasn't to label somebody or to criticize somebody or judge somebody. Of course, it's been used for all those things, unfortunately, yeah. in various circumstances. But the, the, really the, the purpose initially for diagnosis was just like in a medical, you know, in the medical field. If you go in and you have appendicitis, that diagnosis right. tells the doctor what he needs to do or she needs to do, exactly. right, to make you yeah. better. Mm. That was the idea behind psychiatric diagnoses to help people in the in that field communicate with each other so they would know what treatment works best. Mm -hmm. Now of course it's sometimes it's used for other things, such as prediction and, you know, such as unfortunately sometimes labeling or judging people. But that's not that was not the intention behind it. Yeah, I mean colloquially that's the main exactly. <laughs> usage exactly. of it. it is. But and, and if you go far back in time uh, before they started with this diagnosis, because we have had psychopaths with us forever, but I'm, I'm thinking maybe back then, first off, I think mm -hmm. uh, in natural communities, people are in general more healthy, but uh, there must have been psychopaths even in the most ideal paradise, but they probably were ascribed to like demon possession or, or curses or something like that, right? Possible. And then where as uh, psychology evolves and emerges, um, they start recognizing it. And I think moral uh, crisis, moral insanity is a very good uh, description. But uh, when you talk about antisocial personal disorder, is that mm -hmm. the, like the long name for sociopathy or is sociopathy something else? So when you're, you know, one of the things that was the ideal in looking at diagnoses in the United States, and it has its pluses and minuses, but I think overall the intent was a positive one. And that is, if we're going to make these diagnoses, we need to focus on behavior. Mm. and not on the person's internal workings because we don't know those internal workings, right? Mm. So a lot of our personality disorders, if you look at the definitions, you will see things like, you know, breaking a rule or um, this person is, uh, you know, has criminal versatility. Or this person is irresponsible as, you know, evidenced by these behaviors as opposed to how they're feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's very difficult for people to agree on that. And so antisocial personality disorder is a personality disorder that basically involves breaking a lot of laws and rules in society, starting from an early age. So, so hang on. So, so if you, if you live in, let's say, Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. having an antisocial personality disorder would be a badge of honor <laughs> because you would be like, you know, a rebel against the system. Well, see, you would think that, right? But, but it's always in a somewhat of a social context. Right. So if it's a socially accepted system and somebody was um, breaking rules, you're right. I guess it depends on what rules you are breaking. 
but I guess in theory, but you would you'd be breaking laws. And so it's typically somebody who has antisocial personality disorder is somebody, for example, who's chronically lying to other people, who's stealing, who's mm-hmm. getting in, in trouble with the law, who um, before age 15 is engaging in um, all kinds of substance abuse. And and and, not, and again, you know, we know there's there, obviously there's a typical adolescence. Right. Mm. And experimentation and those kind of things. Mm. So it's kind of saying this person is outside the norm from an early age. This person began hitting teachers, getting suspended, getting expelled, using drugs. Um, this person began you know, engaging in all kinds of lying, manipulating other people. And so th- those might be a part of an antisocial personality disorder. But that person might still have the capacity Even though they might have poor impulse control, be irresponsible, that person might still be able to feel bad about what they do. Hmm. That person still might be able to have a sense of guilt or have a sense of empathy for other people. They may choose to ignore that, but they have the capacity for that. That would be somebody who might have antisocial personality disorder but would not be a psychopath. Really, the hallmark right because a psychopath or a sociopath doesn't have empathy. That's the big difference. It is. You know, it really is. Because in terms of behavior, you may not see the difference. I mean, two people, both of them knock down another guy. One of them may enjoy it even. And the other man yes. may have, be remorseful. Yeah, right. Yes. And so B- both really of them is- are anti, anti-social personal uh, behavior, but it's the internal thing that determines whether it's a psychopath or not, right? Exactly. So you may have somebody, for example, who's part of a gang. Mm. And that person grows up in a gang. And maybe this person's father was in a gang or mom is in a gang. And so they develop this kind of criminal lifestyle, right? Because mm. that was what they knew. Yep. And so they're doing all these things. They're getting involved. They're in juvenile hall. They're getting, they're stealing. They're, they're, you know, getting involved in fights. They're getting in, in gang wars and those kind of things. So outwardly, you'd go, yeah, this is somebody who has antisocial personality disorder, but this person may be an incredibly loving member of his family. Mm. may take care of his gang brothers and sisters, right? Mm. And have a, a huge capacity to experience empathy and or guilt or remorse. So it's almost like that's a lifestyle, but it doesn't mean that person lacks the ability mm. to care for other people or to feel guilt or remorse if they do something wrong. Mm. But uh, maybe it's just my impression, but lately narcissism have become very uh, popular like it's it's a term that's floating much more about now than psychopathy. It used to be opposite. I think you're right. Um, is narcissism like a subcategory of psychopathy or how would we distinguish between psychopathy, sociopathy and narcissism? I think that this is such a great question. I think maybe the, the short answer would be that all psychopaths are narcissistic, mm. but all narcissists are not psychopaths. Right. Right. So, you know, in the DSM-5, narcissistic personality disorder is a separate personality disorder from psychopathy. And so when you're looking at, you know, okay, what does somebody who with MPD look like? This is somebody who has, for example, a grandiose sense of self-importance, who has fantasies of success and power, a kind of a belief in one's specialness, a desire for admiration, a sense of entitlement. They're, they're often very exploitive of other people. They have an incredible need to have, be the center of attention. And be liked. And yeah. to, be, to be liked. Mm. Uh, or, yeah, and to be admired. To be envied, uh, they oftentimes seek power. Um, there's also, though, I think that's the kind of the grandiose narcissism. One of the things we're recognizing, I think, over the past ten years is that there's also a vulnerable narcissism, where you have somebody who, deep down, is so insecure and has so, such low self-esteem that they kind of their outward presentation is like a mask mm. for him, for, you know, for him. Compensation. Or a compensation exactly mm. and so that person outwardly might still present just as entitled uh, just as insensitive to other people just as intention seeking um just as unable to bear criticism as somebody who is you know grandiose but mm. the kind of the underneath is different mm. um so there seems to be some subcategories of narcissistic personality disorder that we didn't recognize for a while now of course let me just also say as you started out today that we're all, we all have, hopefully, have a healthy degree of narcissism. 
you know, which of self interest. So mm. it kind of gets to that spectrum that you were talking about, which mm. can kind of be annoying, but it's true. There is a spectrum of all of these things and we all fall somewhere on that spectrum. It's when again, uh, you know, when you're talking about a personality disorder, it's not that it's situational. If this person feels entitled, this person, this person feels special. This person is exploitive across all areas of his or her life. Yeah, okay, so it's when it becomes extreme. Yes. But uh, would you say that it's possible to have a narcissistic personality disorder, which is not an antisocial personality disorder? In terms of, you know, again, definitionally, it certainly is possible to have a narcissistic personality disorder and not be engaged in a criminal activity. Because one of the world's experts in narcissism claims he himself is a narcissist. Uh -huh. <laughs> which made me very cr skeptical to everything he says. What's his agenda? Do you know who I'm talking uh, about? I, th I think I do, although <laughs> I don't think I want to guess. <laughs> he's, uh, uh, I think he's a Jew or he's from Europe, uh, Mediterranean somewhere. I forgot yes. his name too. I was considering interviewing him, but I feel I feel better talking with you about this. I wouldn't trust <laughs> what he said, you know, because if it's true, yeah. uh, if he really is like an extreme... Like he doesn't have that connection uh -huh. in my uh, more spiritual terms, I would say connection with the soul. Then, uh, you know, I have to question everything they say because there will be an agenda. There will be motives. You know what I mean? I do. Yeah. I do. And I think I do know who you're talking about. So it's definitely possible to have NPD. I'll just use that short, that's short term yeah. or shortcut. Um, it certainly is possible to have all those personality traits and not be engaged in criminal activity. And if you look at the some of the criteria for antisocial personality disorder, a lot of the criteria involve kind of criminal activity. So there are people who specialize in psychopathy, for example, who will talk about there being, you know, an overrepresentation of people with psychopathy who are CEOs or politicians. Yeah, I was, I was going to get, get to that later, but okay, let's go there. <laughs> Yeah, go on. So, yeah. So, you you know, unfortunately, there are endless ways to exploit other people. Right? Yeah, exactly. You don't have to be like a brute about it. I was exactly. going to say to you, I was going to point out to you that when you uh, people you work with are what I, in my layman terms, would call unintelligent psychopaths because they haven't managed to uh, play the system. Yes. So they are like, oh, reacting like brutes there and then. Right. But if you really if you are. You know, the, the, whatever, narcissist, sociopath, psychopath, but you're intelligent and you seek power, you seek domination, you seek uh, exploitation, etc. Mm -hmm. You will, I'm thinking, and most people obviously who look into this are thinking that you will find ways to, you know, uh, get that out in your life and ascend to some position. And we all know, of course, those people who has managed to attain one ounce of power and they exploit it for all it's worth, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but imagine people who really get power. You can just look at history. It's full of, uh, I'd say, moral insane people who order all sorts of destruction. So we should expect the same to happen today, too. I completely agree with you. You're right. And I think it has to do with intelligence in terms of how these personality traits or disorders manifest themselves. And I think oftentimes it has to do with their upbringing. I mm. mean, a lot of times you will see there's some seems to be some genetic, at least predisposition to some of these personality disorders. And so, so if you grow up in a family, I was doing an interview for a show recently where the the dad it certainly if it was a, a criminal show and this the dad apparently I mean just from all accounts documented as well as people who knew him mm -hmm. was clearly somebody whose values were not consistent with caring for other people or empathy or guilt I mean his whole philosophy and his whole parenting style mm. was winning and not getting caught Mm. That was his whole parenting style. So if his son stole something, it wasn't – he never got in trouble unless he got caught. Mm. And you could see his children just developing the same kind of value system that really devalued other people. Um, it, you know, it was just a, it was a multi-generational kind of thing. And these individuals were not criminals in terms of they hadn't been arrested or whatever, but mm. clearly their behavior and their values and their whole – 
attitudes were, were, were criminal. Uh, yeah, because they were erased to don't get caught. Now, this is interesting because it goes straight into another point uh, I have scheduled uh, to touch today, and that's causations. And yes. It seems to me you could produce uh, psychopathic-ish people, but the, I, I think the big difference would be if there would be an inner voice that said, um, you know, a conscious, uh, what you say in English, uh, not consciousness, but conscientious. You know, like conscience. Conscience. So there mm-hmm. would be a conscience that would protest to some, because I believe some ethical things are universal. Like, like when we discussed, if you live in a context, let's say you live in Saudi Arabia and you're a woman and you break the law because you drive a car or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. You, you know, that, that's criminal. That's breaking the laws and the system. But it's not something that would be acknowledged universally, whereas if you steal and rape and murder, that's universal. It's a golden rule, right? Yeah. So I believe that there is an inner voice in people who are not pathological that would protest the golden rule, even if you are worn down. Because you can see people who are grown up in most horrible circumstances, if they just get one ray of light... That can be enough to save them later in life. Yes. Uh, whereas if everything is just completely uh, black and hopeless, it, it may crush them. So, so I, I'm thinking there is some kind of predisposition. Maybe it's born. What is the general um, view in psychology today about that? If, if there is a general view. Well, I'm not sure there is a general view. I mean, I've read everything from that we would all be psychopaths. It's our ties to our family and our society that instills that inner voice all the way to what you're proposing, which is, Mm. Hey, we all are kind of born with this innate knowledge or this innate sensitivity to other people. And we do know that babies can show empathy for each other. So there's certainly some animals too. Yeah, exactly. So there's certainly something that we have the capacity for, Mm. um, I think the challenge becomes, I've certainly seen, I guess what I believe is, I think that that ray of sunshine that you were talking about, Al, is so important. Mm. And I think when you, when I look at, at people who wind up in the criminal justice system here, um, who came from horribly abusive families, a lot of times what I see is that light was not there or it was so dim. And then you see other people who have just have horrible histories, trauma, et cetera. And I've seen people in prison who did have that light. You know, so I, I mean, mm. I, don't, I don't think everybody who's in prison by any means is psychopathic. That's a very small percentage of people who are in, in prison even. Are, are they um, the guys who rule the prison? <laughs> Are they the guys who rule the prison? Yeah. Are they like a uh, top? Uh, Those are the guards you're of... talking about. We can talk about. <laughs> well, well, but yeah, but you have an inner society uh, away from the guards too, you know. Well, there's so many. I mean, gosh, there's so many yeah. politics in prison that we could spend hours talking okay, about okay. who that. rules the prison and for right, what right, reason. Right. Um, but I think certainly when you were talking about intelligence, I think certainly becomes a, a, an advantage. In any situation, including when you're incarcerated, yeah. in terms of how you survive and how you learn to survive. Yeah, yeah, brute force isn't enough. Um, but um, I guess it's interesting what you say that there's no agreement because that just shows it boils down to paradigms. Yeah, someone who would think that, like your husband is fond of saying, he says um, biological robot in a what does he say in a soulless universe i forgot the term but there are those who believe that and they would obviously think you know no we can all be psychopaths and to the other extreme which is that we reincarnate or whatever so uh, there is a soul and and stuff so uh, i can see it's kind of reassuring actually that they haven't determined it's this is the explanation <laughs> because it's no, it's, it's and, open you know my personal belief i think or my firstly thought about when i think about it is that I think most of us, by far, most of us are born with the capacity for empathy, the capacity for remorse and for guilt and those kind of things. I think Mm -hmm. there probably is a very, very, very small subset of of people who are born with a deficit in that area. Okay, well, if if you have to uh, give it a number, how many percent would you guess? 
Oh, I would say very small percentage. I mean, I would say like less than one. Less than one percent. Really? I would think yes. Yeah, wow. I, I do. That means um, that that means that most of the psychopathy we see is not generated by an inborn. They, they're not like internally damaged. Uh, well, they are, but they are not. It's it's not inborn. It's created psychopathy then. Well, I because think there's much more than one percent psychopaths. That's for sure. Or wouldn't you agree with that? Yes, but I think there's a much smaller percent of people who really fit the definition of psychopathy than we think. I think right. that's an overused term. Okay. So I don't think, you know, I think if you look at the prevalence of psychopathy, you're going to see, what, 2 to 5% at the very most mm-hmm. of individuals. So it's a relatively small number of people. And I, I think that psychopathy, probably like a lot of, uh, of diagnoses or problems, are a perfect storm to some extent. You know, where you have somebody who might be born with the genetic vulnerability um, to have these kind of emotional deficits. We're all, you know, it's funny, we're all so comfortable with the idea that people can be born with intellectual deficits, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, somebody is born with the Down syndrome mm-hmm. and or somebody is born with another disorder. Or we all know that intelligence is on a, a curve, Right. So not everybody is average intelligence or people who are very intelligent, people who are less intelligent. I think uh, we, and we ha- can't even agree about defining intelligence because there's different. Yeah, types, we, right? we, we can't. Yeah. But I think we intuitively we recognize that there are people who are smart or less smart or mm. more smart just in terms of who we know. Right. Mm. You know, or, or, and when we were in school. And we're studying subjects. There are people who it comes quicker to than other people. I don't think we, we think about that as so much in the emotional category. Mm. You know, that there might be people who are born who, for whatever reason, just seem to have more of a deficit in that area. And I think if you have that person and that person has a traumatic childhood mm. and they don't have that ray of light you're mm. talking about, which can come from a lot of different sources. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you look at resilience and we know that if they're like you said, if there's one person in a child's life who cares about them, it's amazing what that can yeah. do, that that one connection can do to buffer them exactly. from horrible things that happen to them. But I think when you have that combination of genetic vulnerability and then you have trauma, and, you know, traumatic childhood and a lot of other factors, then you do end up with somebody who is psychopathic. Mm. I'm still unclear on the difference between psychopathy and sociopathy. Mm. That's a, I think that's a, and I think traditionally they've been viewed in this way. Psychopathy, the view has, the view is, is somebody who is more likely to have been born with that emotional deficit we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And so there was this kind of genetic loading. And so, and then the, the sociopath is somebody who was made Essentially, oh, okay. it's almost like the person's environment was so traumatic and right. so severely dysfunctional that maybe they did have a spark of empathy like most of us do, but it was just extinguished yeah. because their environment was so bad. They worn down. Yeah, th- th- this is. Yeah. So so let's say like the ISIS, uh, as you call it in uh, America, Daesh, uh, better term, but the, those who, who become warriors there. Mm-hmm would be sociopathic, but not necessarily psychopathic. They're, they're a result of culture, of society, of indoctrination, probably trauma. And so they become manufactured uh, dogs of war. But as babies, they were not all doomed to become like that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mm. And, you know, I have a colleague who has worked with, obviously, you have to be 18 to be diagnosed with a personality disorder in the United States. You would never... label a child as a psychopath or narcissist or whatever. But there have been some attempts to kind of go, okay, we have such a difficult time when somebody meets the definition of psychopathy in adulthood. We don't know what to do with them. We're not very good at treating them. So can we find, are there clues to um, these children Early on, Recognizing that we could yeah. maybe mm-hmm. recognize mm-hmm. And, and and help and intervene, and so there's been a lot of attempts. And so, what you, there has been some some pretty good research to suggest that, and this is more like you're talking about, more for the the psychopath, right? Not for the sociopath, mm. um, but for for these for children who the, the the term that's used is callous and unemotional. 
mm. children. So you don't, again, you would never diagnose a, a, a child as a psychopath, but th- there have been some studies. No, but, but most people, if they see a child torturing an animal, they, exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, or somebody falls down and they're laughing and, you know, cruel, cruelty and bullying and, and mm. uh, again, over a period of time across settings, mm. then we can perhaps intervene with children who may need to learn cognitive empathy. You know, in other words, we know that empathy- like, like Dexter, you know, the series. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because that's interesting because <laughs> that's the concept is interesting. Yeah, here, just for folks who don't know, it's like a serial killer. And the concept is that he's born a serial killer. Like he, this isn't created. He has a loving father and the father recognizes it, but he doesn't want him to be snatched by the system. Yeah. So the father installs into him a codex, a more ethical, moral codex, only go for the bad guys. But those have at it <laughs> so right. I, i'm wondering you know to what extent that's realistic well i think what we found with you know with children who are exhibiting these kind of callous and unemotional traits um from you know from an early age there have been two things that seem to, to be helpful one is and it's just the opposite of what you would think um I guess intuitively, because you, and and unfortunately, it seems to be the opposite of what a lot of parents do, because Mm -hmm. you think if I see my child who's five years old, who is hurting another child or laughing when another child is hurt or just displaying this lack of empathy, what's your natural reaction? It's going to be to come down on that child, right? To punish this child in some respect. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that's the worst possible thing. They don't respond to punishment. What they tend to respond to is a more loving environment, which focuses on rewarding for positive things. So it's very Pavlovian then. It is. It is. And so they found that some, you know, this, uh, you know, one of the best things to intervene is do this kind of parent management training where you teach parents to really focus in on this child and focus on these positive things and shaping them and, and, and that seems to be more effective and this kind of punitive, like, how could you treat your sister this way or what are you doing? Or, you know, I'm going to punish you because you aren't showing empathy. Of course, we all know that as parents, you can't really punish somebody into feeling feeling bad for something. No. Right. It has the opposite effect. But plus, I don't know. Plus, how- uh, I don't know how you relate to him, but it is what it is. Dr. Phil, yes. he makes a point out of uh, that you give them negative attention and that's still attention. So it becomes like, uh, I've seen enough shows with him where children who display horrible, you know, we would think that demon uh, possessed or something. And it often boils down to they just, they need any kind of attention. And when they just get negative attention all the time, well, that's what they're going for in some twisted way. Absolutely. No, that makes, yes, you're, that's a very good point. I think, okay. you know, Every child would rather have some attention than no attention. Mm. And I think that's true. And so when you have a child who's getting negative attention, even if it's not initially intended to seek that attention, it's just that the way this child is kind of developing, it becomes reinforcing. Mm. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I think I have a clearer difference now between psychopathy, sociopathy, and narcissism. Uh, I guess – I mean, narcissism I knew a lot of already, so I, I, I hope also the listeners have a clearer distinction. But I want to introduce a fourth, which I insist belongs in this category. Okay. Uh, and uh, interestingly, maybe you wouldn't agree, but from an observational standpoint, it seems to me to strike women much more. Whereas the general notion about psychopathy or at least sociopathy is that it strikes men more. But... BPD, borderline personality disorder. Let's start with the defining it. You know, borderline personality disorder, I think, is one of the most misunderstood and stigmatized personality disorders. And it certainly is much more likely to be diagnosed in women as yeah. opposed to men. As a matter of fact, there have been some studies that have shown that if you have very similar behaviors and you give these behaviors a description to clinicians and they're, they're the same and you just change the gender that wow. women are going to be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And the man will be. And the man's going to be antisocial personality disorder. Right, mm-hmm. right. But there is a, a, an antisocial disorder in BPD too because even though some of them, at the face of it at least, turn it inwards, It's like passive aggressive. It's still having a destructive uh, impact on environment. It's just that it's much more sneaky uh, or or indirect, if you see what I mean. 
Yes. And so let's talk about the, like you were saying, the definition of borderline. So it's yeah. nine symptoms and you have to meet at least five of them, okay. uh, which is true of all the personality disorders. You, you know, very rarely does somebody meet every single oh, criteria. Okay. Mm. They just have to meet the majority of them most often. Right. Um, and it really, I think, you know, probably the, if you have to boil it down in a nutshell, then I'll go through the, through the different criteria. It's really a dysregulation of the self mm-hmm. and it's a dysregulation of emotions. So some of the symptoms are unstable. But, but hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay. Dysregulation, that's not a, a word everybody immediately will get. So dysregulation just means there's no continuity. It's like my sense of self can change from minute to minute. Okay. Uh, my ability to control my emotions can change from minute to minute. And, you know, here's a here's kind of an example of that. Mm-hmm. When I was in training, I remember a, a professor of mine saying, you will know that you meet somebody who has borderline personality disorder because when you meet this person, this person will think you are God. <laughs> In the beginning. <laughs> exactly. Until you become the devil. Right. And so that's kind of an example of just this kind of this, in, this the insta- unstable view of themselves and other people and their emotions. And because of that, their lives are chaotic on the inside and their lives are chaotic on the outside oftentimes. So, and, and, you know, you and I might say, okay. Here's my husband, Alex, who I love. And I can tell you three wonderful things about him and three things that I, that I don't like so much about him. I'm able to. Uh, I guess we can do this with everyone we know very well. Yeah, exactly. Of yeah. course. Ex- yeah. Of course. So in other words, when I'm mad at him, it's easier to focus on the three I don't like, but I still recognize that he's gray. Like we mm. all are, right? He's not black or white. He's mm. gray. But somebody who truly meets that definition is truly BPD. It really is like that person does become the devil. Right. All or everything is that. Yeah. They're unable to hold this kind of idea of people can have pluses and minuses. And so when, when, when you're in on the good side, then you are wonderful. You're idealized. You're fantastic. But then the minute you do something that's rejecting or upsetting, and we all do in relationships, then it, that, then they flip. Mm. And so what you see are things like this. Again, unstable relationships, intense relationships, um, impulsivity. Hypersexual. Sometimes mm-hmm. what you see is impulsivity. That can be sexual. And, and lying, lying all the time. Uh, it can be. Okay. Let's, so t- let's go through some of the – so all these can be. But So some of the okay. criteria are, again – Frantic efforts to avoid any kind of abandonment. And that's where you, you're talking about. You can see somebody, for example, who might threaten suicide. Right. If somebody's going to break up with them. Yeah. Um, somebody becoming violent if you're going to break up with them. They just can't, you know, self harming when mm. you're going to break up with them or leave, or they think you're going to leave them. These unstable, intense relationships, as I mentioned earlier, this kind of identity disturbance, not knowing who they are. They date this one person and they are a hippie. They, they date the next person, they become completely who that other person thinks they should be or who they think they should be. Right. We talked about the impulsivity. That can be everything. It can be substance abuse. It can be sex. It can be, um, you know, spending, it can be, it's impulsivity. It can be leaving it, quitting a job. It can be shopping. It can be a lot of different things. Mm. Um, inappropriate or intense anger mm. or the inability to control it. Um, so as you can see, suicidal behavior or gestures or threats. So it really is somebody, I think, who just, again, they have this kind of unstable sense of who they are. Yeah. And they have this incredible, oftentimes, anger and rage, which isn't always expressed outwardly. No. You have kind of the quiet borderline, which is kind of what you were talking about. Somebody who internalizes things, maybe does self-harm or cutting mm. or those kind of things, um, or the outwardly aggressive borderline. But there's somebody who really, their whole their whole insides, basically, is just so chaotic and unstable, and it just manifests itself on the outside as well. Uh, And this is trauma generated or is it? It it almost always is trauma related. Okay. Um, There's very rarely have I seen somebody 
with borderline personality disorder who did not have a pretty extensive history of some trauma in their background or family. Okay, I have to complain about something, but it's probably been, um, you, you probably noticed it, but I have personal experience with this. And uh, uh, you like the cliche, oh, my ex is a psychopath. Well, I can say I have an ex who is BPD and she had it as a diagnosis. It's not my, uh, you know, <laughs> stigmatizing of her. She had PTSD and BPD. I think she had some other stuff too. And oh, wow. uh, when you went through the list now, I could see bam, 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 where, mm. you know, but, but it has different expressions, not suicidal. But, you know, in the beginning, I was like a god. And at the end, mm -hmm. she tried to convince the whole world that I was a psychopath. It was horrible. Oh, no. <laughs> And and so, yeah, I'd fall from grace. And that's when I started to look into BPD and uh, try to understand what's going on here, because uh, I, I always try to stay in good terms with my access. So I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, this was a first for me. And in her case, I'm pretty sure it was trauma related. So PTSD, in addition to uh, BPD, should give away some of the, the clues. So, But, but I, I've seen it called uh, colloquially uh, female psychopathy because it's very common to, you know, males can very often go outward with violence, whereas a more common female version would be, you know, manipulations and, and stuff like that. So, and in, mm -hmm. in those terms... I, I guess narcissists who are females will also do some of the same things. But I think the difference between a BPD and a narcissist doing destructive thing that's not violence, and correct me if you disagree, sure. is that in a BPD case, it's like a survival mechanism. Like you said, it's, let's say, oh, I um, date guys and then I drop them before they drop me, for example. So there, there it would be like a, a defense mechanism, whereas in a narcissist's case, it's it's not a defense. It's just oh uh, something else is interesting my <laughs> attention, so I'm going there. You see what I mean? I do see what you mean, mm. and I, and I do think that there is some validity to what you're saying. I mean, I heard one okay. one uh, colleague and I were talking about that one time, and and his thoughts were, and I think there's some research to back this up, was that we were talking before about the cognitive versus the emotional empathy. Yeah. Cognitive, just meaning I can understand, right? Mm -hmm. That you are feeling a certain way. I don't feel it. No. I don't get it, right? But I understand that. And that, you know, his, his thoughts were that somebody who has NP, NPD, not BPD, NPD has cognitive empathy, but they don't have emotional empathy. So right. they can use that cognitive empathy to make decisions. Um, to manipulate other people to get what they want, but they just can't feel it. And, and get away from the law. Exactly. With BPD, it's the opposite. Mm. It's that they have the emotional empathy, but mm. they don't have the cognitive empathy. And so they're much more likely to react and it to be a survival thing and to be impulsive Interesting. and it to be kind of chaotic. Yeah. And, and it's because there's not, it's almost like that all the feelings are there, but they don't understand where they're coming from and what they mean. And it can be very traumatic for the people that are with. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a book called, I think, Walking on Eggshells. I don't know if you've ever heard of that book, no. but it's about borderline personality disorder. Mm. And, you know, a lot of times individuals who've been in a relationship with somebody with BPD will talk about that's kind of what they felt like. Right. That they were kind of walking around on eggshells because they never knew what was going to set that person off. Mm. Mm. That, that's so interesting. It, it, it's so clear how you described it now. That's good. But um, I think, uh, uh, you know, f from the outside, people just notice, oh, destruction, 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 right? But the interesting distinctions are when you start going on the inside and, and also when you uh, start to uh, look at causations. Yeah. And would you say that narcissism, like BPD and sociopathy is generated uh, by environment? Okay. Psychopathy, probably born, whether it's some kind of brain damage or whatever. What about narcissism? Isn't that also born like psychopathy? There's not a lot of research I'm aware of that looks at narcissism from a hereditary standpoint. I mean, we talked about the overlap between narcissism and psychopathy and that, you know, generally we kind of think of all psychopaths are narcissists, but the reverse is not true. Yeah. So. I think that the jury is still out on how much narcissism is inherited or is genetic or you know, we don't know what genetic means. Like you said, is it brain structure? Mm. Is it hormones? Is it something we don't know? Mm. Um, so I would probably put that category more in terms of, of you know, 
if you had to, to have to, if you had the nature nurture category and you had to slide it into one, I think I would probably slide it more into the nurture category. Narcissism. Um, narcissism oh, as okay. opposed to the psychopathy. Yeah. Category, which is, again, we tend, we tend to think has a little bit more of a genetic loading than, yeah. or, 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 you know, than we do some of the other personality disorders. The other thing that's interesting when you're talking about BPD is that, You know, one of the challenges, I think, with, for example, psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder or NPD is that rarely do individuals who meet those diagnoses voluntarily seek treatment. Right. Because they tend to think that, why should I seek treatment? Because it's everybody else's fault, right? (laughs) Whatever my problems are, I have nothing to do with it. But that that wouldn't apply to BPD, would it? It doesn't. Exactly. It does Mm. not. You know, uh, with BPD, it's you see many more people. And actually, if you're looking at, you know, if you want to put your money on who's going to get better with treatment, your <laughs> your money should go with BPD, right? right. If that person's motivated. Yeah. But the challenge is that again, is that it's such a long standing. By the time it's that diagnosis is there, it's very difficult to change, but it's not impossible. And oftentimes, that person is at least more motivated because right. they they experience so much distress. Yeah. Yeah, and, it and it's might, emotion. It still might be your fault. Pardon? <laughs> it still might be your fault, I think, maybe. But yeah. there's a lot of chaos and, and pain and distress that's going on as well. Yeah, I, I think a very important clue that you uh, delivered is, you know, they they can have, uh, you can have mental or emotional empathy. I, I would say like mental um, sympathy is probably better. But this big question is, do they respect it? Because if you feel it in yourself, which is the base definition of empathy. It's the ability to identify others' experiences with your own uh, in terms of uh, f- feeling it. But exactly. if you just r- recognize it mentally, like Dexter, going back to that example, he would know, obviously, that people he tortured and killed were horrified and... <laughs> <laughs> he would himself be horrified when he was captured. But the thing is, they don't have to respect it because it has no impact. Unless you're instilled with some kind of mm. ideal or norm or like an internal law, like, for instance, in an ideology or a religious concept where you would use that as a mechanism, which I think actually is better than just letting them loose. And just going by base instincts. <laughs> yeah, no, no I, th- I think you're right. But the other thing I think with NPD is that there is that need for attention and that sense of being special. So there right. is a need for other people on a limited level, but there yeah. is, unlike with psychopathy, right? Right, where it's life is kind of more of a game and you might be a chess piece. I'm moving around. Yeah. Um, so I think there is, you know, there's there is some debate on. Can somebody who is MPD have empathy? Some people say no, and some research suggests impaired empathy, not no empathy, but impaired empathy, Mm. because the person is so consumed with him or herself that there's not much room for it. Yeah, but you can trick them. You can trick them if they relate it to themselves. And and as long as they respond. Yes, you're right. There's room for there. You're right. There's room for negotiation there. Um, Unlike, like I said, unlike with with psychopathy. Yeah, yeah, and as long as long as they respond to, as long as they have social needs, you have some. It's like this dog likes this food, so let's use this food to train some tricks. Yes. Because uh, if a narcissist is dependent, if they feel empty and dead without the outer feedback, that's a way you can approach them. I'm thinking. Yes. Well, certainly, you know, if you have a need to be treated specially, to be entitled, you know, you have to, you know, to be, to be revered. You're right. There is a social need there. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I, I saw Dr. Phil use, apply that in, okay. Uh, Dr. Phil isn't my extent of psychological <laughs> insight, folks. Okay. It's just, <laughs> it's just that I've seen a lot of episodes. Because it's it's like it's like a reality show on a psychological level. It's like a, a, a little more advanced version of what was it called in the old days? Geraldo. Um, Geraldo. You know, yeah, those oh, yeah. shows. Remember those shows? Mm-hmm. This is a little better version. 
And he had a, a fitness guy who was, uh, no, he didn't recognize uh, his anabolic steroid abuse. And here, uh, Phil applied that. So he said, look, if people saw you here and they saw that you manned up and you had balls to change this and fix this, uh, if, if it was me, I would give you a job uh, and, and you, you would be admired. But if you are weaseling away, uh, or, you, so he appealed to his narcissistic traits. Uh-huh. It, it wasn't obvious for unless you're aware of these. Uh, more subtle points and it worked eventually he yeah 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 okay I'm it's a problem so I, I think uh, like you say there's a little more hope for narcissists even though you may not be able to change them on the inside at least on a behavioral uh, level because that's what we're discussing at the end of the day right behavior it is yeah it is we can't always change how people feel but people can certainly change how they behave and make different choices if they're motivated to do so. And you're right. Sometimes it's a matter of, um, you know, finding what need and how to meet that need. I mean, one of the things I've seen um, police officers struggle with sometimes is, you know, if you have a suspect in custody that you think is <clears throat> narcissistic, for example, as you're talking about, then flattering that person and appealing to their ego is going to mm. be very effective. Right. Talking to, the, talking to them about how the victim might feel <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, how the, devastated the family is. I mean, the person mm. might fake it and be mm. like, oh, yeah, that, but no, that's not going to work. Mm. Right. Very interesting, all this stuff. Um, I feel, uh, I think I need to do more psychological oriented shows. Oh, that's nice. We do a lot of philosophical. Um, Good. But psychology is, in my view, it's just philosophy on an interpersonal level. So a practical day to day level. Now, Let's say a a narcissist, a a sociopath, a psychopath and a BPD met in in a bar. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm challenging your creativity here. I'm not sure where this is going. (laughs) No, well, I'm just asking you, how would we be able to tell the difference? Uh, It goes to examples of how it manifests in everyday life. How would we, let's say it's a cliche narcissist, a cliche sociopath, a cliche psychopath and a cliche BPD. Okay. What would they uh, do? Not necessarily interact, but, you know, how would we be able to tell the difference? Wow, that's such an interesting question. And very challenging, but let's see how creative. Well, no, it's it's a good one. I'm just trying to think (laughs) this through because, you know, I think in reality, we would probably be able to tell maybe the NPD and BPD most easily. Yeah. Um, I think... You know, with BPD, as we said before, this person might be more impulsive, might be more, um, uh, you know, more likely to idealize the people that she's with and just establish the, the narcissist, probably. <laughs> Perhaps. I, actually, I, I would think that might be true. Um, but would certainly be, would we be connecting more likely with one person? Mm. Um, as opposed to trying to get the attention of the whole group right. and bonding quickly with that person. Mm. Um, the NPD person would be looking to get the attention of the whole group mm. and would be more likely to be the person who's bragging and talking about all his accomplishments, not really asking much about what the other people are thinking or much about their lives. So we're talking stereotypes, as you said, cliches. Of course, of course. And also, speaking of stereotypes, is it preposterous to suggest that Probably over representation of narcissists within sales. I think there is no question that <laughs> certain personality. Let me, I'm going to punt a little bit, but only a tiny bit, because okay. I think that's probably true. But I also think that that's so different from any other personality trait. So right. there are obviously certain professions that are going to attract naturally people with certain personality traits yeah yeah but i take it back because in sales you need to understand the customer you need some empathy actually that's always a good thing isn't it but then again you may have empathy as a narcissist anyway go on um back to the bar so back to the bar so we've talked about the bpd and the npd um and then i think you know if if this was an intelligent psychopath Mm -hmm. then we would we would never know it right we would never so that would be the normal guy Exactly. That would mm-hmm. be the normal guy. Mm-hmm. And to, to a lesser extent, I think the same thing would be true for a sociopath. 
because it's typically more, I think oftentimes when we try to look at the distinction between sociopaths and psychopaths, and again, in theory, it's just the fact how, how they get to where they, where they, where they are, right? right. It's the nature right. versus nurture when mm-hmm. you look at psychopathy and sociopathy. I think practically speaking, uh, you would find that maybe this sociopath was not quite as sophisticated. Yeah. Not quite as able to pull off a mask as the psychopath. So he's probably the one who would be violent the first. Start a fight or something. Perhaps. If, if provoked. Yeah, provoked. If provoked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, definitely. If provoked. Mm. Mm-hmm. Maybe provoked by the psychopath. Yes, for fun. <laughs> for fun. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, this is a cr- very cool exercise because people get it. Although, of course, this is like stereotype. It's, it's extreme. It's, it's cartoonish. But the more unfamiliar you are with this, the, the better it is because everybody can relate to these things because everybody has experienced it. But it's maybe not just put into a system like you work with in psychology, right? Where you have yes. like a, a kind of a map. And, and that's what we're trying. We're just trying to put people's experiences into a map. Absolutely. And so, and, and in your case, you have a first-hand experience face-to-face, probably, I'm just guessing, with some very disturbed people. Yes, I would say that's accurate. I bet it's not just innocent people you're visiting in prison, so. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> and contrary to what a lot of people think, most people don't say they're innocent in prison even. Mm. They pretty much acknowledge that they're in there for... Yeah, our- but but you know, uh, being Scandinavian and all, I have to say, I'm extremely critical of the American prison industry. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you know anything about our criminal um, system. A little bit. I know it's a lot less draconian <laughs> than I You can say that. Yeah. It's been on CNN and stuff like, uh, oh, in Norway, they reward criminals. And, oh, look at the prisons. They're like hotels. Okay. <laughs> but we have uh, record numbers of non-repeating. Like they get restored to society, you know what yeah. I mean? It, it's not about revenge, it's about uh, restoring. Mm-hmm. So, but then again, we don't have like a system which profits from prisoners. So, I think that's essential. Yeah. But anyway, let's, let's move on. Okay. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. I would like you to, maybe just switching gears here, uh, okay. a very smooth transition, but if you could give examples in extreme and criminal cases, examples, for example, from your profession or case studies or whatever, uh, where we can hear, because you should think twice before you accuse someone of being a psychopath when you hear <laughs> yeah. real life ex- uh, examples. So uh, give us something that would be undoubtedly defined as psychopathy or, or sociopathy then. So an example from real life is that what you're asking for al yeah like, yeah primarily from re- real life i bet you have so let's just stick to real life of a psychopath or a sociopath uh yeah like it, it's not their ex you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah something that's uh, well if not shock at least something that people get it okay so i i'm th- i'm thinking of um a guy that i met when I was working um, in a minimum or sorry, media maximum security prison. Okay. And he was what they call the shot caller on a certain yard. And the shot caller is kind of the the gang person who calls the shots. Exactly what I was thinking when I asked who runs the prison. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So he certainly had a lot to do with what went on, uh, at least in the gang on his yard. And he was somebody who was pretty ruthless Mm -hmm. in how he 
maneuvered things and not just in prison, because I, I have to say, you know, the, being in, in prison is a whole different world. And so people do all kinds of things to survive in right. prison that they wouldn't necessarily do on the outside. So this person really had just kind of recreated on a lesser scale how he functioned on the outside. Right. Right. And so he's the person who comes to mind to me when I think of a sociopath mm-hmm. as opposed to a psychopath. Mm-hmm. Um, his his father had been a part of the mob. Um, he kind of grew up um, with that value system. And he was, you know, again, if you were not in his space, either as somebody who was part of his gang or outside of it, he really wasn't a danger to anybody else. Okay. He had no desire to hurt somebody for fun. He was very respectful always of the mental health professionals. Um, but there were very clear uh, ideas about how life was going to work on this mm-hmm. yard and outside as well. Mm-hmm. And he was com- 100% ruthless um, and seemed to have absolutely no empathy whatsoever for anybody who crossed him. So that's who I think of when I think about. But, but when you say ruthless, you, you need to put some uh, details into this. Um, how- you know, ordering hits on people in the yard. Um, mm. You know, beating people up, beating people, raping up. them in the shower. That I don't know about. I mean, you know, I. <laughs> That's the cliche. You know, fortu- fortunately for me, Al, I was not a custody officer, which I think is one of the most difficult jobs in the entire universe. Right. So I didn't have privy to some of the things that went on, but I certainly would hear things and and, and you know remember reading in, in his notes that he he was a real he was an instigator. I guess right. that's a good, another good word. Right. So he would pit people against other people. He would create fights among right. different people in the yard. Um, is he that was, going back to the split and rule principle, or is it yes, just? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so that's um, a practical concern then, because if it, because some people get off on just creating conflict no, without necessarily using it strategically, if you see what I mean. Yes. And, and he was, again, he was more of a sociopath in that way where he, I don't think, I mean, I never saw any indication he got pleasure. He okay. got pleasure out of the power yeah. of his position, yeah. for sure. Um, and I think he, were at times, you know, was engaged in more violence than was necessary. So I don't know exactly how to interpret that. So, mm. of course, you know, I, he was not involved in the mental health system. So my information was more secondhand and just talking to other inmates who were in the mental health system. So he's somebody who would n- never have been in the mental health system. That would have mm. been in his, in his mind, something that was just a complete sign of weakness. Right. Right. So my Im- information about him is really more again, from what I've read in his reputation and just for observing and talking to other inmates, because again, somebody, you know, when, when you talk about the kind of the extreme sociopath, they're not going to be getting mental health treatment. No. Right. Because they don't, they don't have any need for that. And then in terms of a psychopath, um, I only met one person. And I have to say, Al, that I wasn't doing a violence risk assessment with this person. So I did not diagnose him as a psychopath formally. Mm. So this is more from my, you know, it is interesting how when you're interacting with so many inmates, one of the things that, you, that I realized pretty quickly, as you already know, is that. They're all individuals and they all have different stories and they all end up there for lots of different reasons. Yeah. And this person just stood out from the minute I met him and he stood out in what might on the surface be a good way in that he remembered my name. Mm-hmm. And that probably seems like a weird thing. But let me tell you, survival is the name of the game, right? When right. you're in prison. And right. so oftentimes if you're a mental health doc, they don't care what mental health doc you are. They might recognize you verbally or, you know, I mean, visually, but, you know, so it struck me initially. I met him once and every time I saw him, he would, would call me by name. And mm. there was just something really slick about him. Mm-hmm. Um, he was very ingratiating with the custody officers. And then I read about his crime, which was just, I, I don't want to go into a ton, ton of detail, but it was just horrendous. And it was, I mean, very- I mean, uh- I mean, oh, 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 yeah, to protect the identity, you mean, or? Exactly. Oh, okay, but, okay. I mean, Otherwise, details I mean, of. Uh, I mean, nobody, nobody would ever know who this person is, but he, yeah. it was, it was sexual assault. It was premeditated. Right. Um, it was extremely brutal. Just, and, and interacting with this guy. And this guy was involved in the mental health system, but he was purely for strategic reasons. Mm. Yeah, because you so, can get the linear sentence, etc. Yeah, right. so if he wanted to get transferred onto a different yard, he would say he was suicidal. 
Mm. He was extremely manipulative. And honestly, out of So he, he was smart enough to play the system a little bit, 100%. even though he was a victim of it. 100%. Mm. And this is somebody, and he, I, you know, and he was, I saw him be very cruel to some of the inmates who were more intellectually disabled. Yeah. And he's the only person that I ever met and, and interviewed and worked with a little bit who I felt like if I was going to do an assessment for psychopathy, which I did not, mm-hmm. I, I would bet my, I'd bet money. Mm. There was something really chilling about him. Mm. Um, and he was so – just the superficial charm that you read about when you talk about psychopathy, mm. he he really had that. And he just did not – he was so good at just pretending to be – he just could play this game. Mm. And in a, in a very different way from the guy I was talking to you about a minute ago. Yeah. Very different. This guy was 100%. But, but, but isn't it true that you can see it in their eyes? You can see this guy. I, I can't yeah. say. I mean, I, again, I can't say. Having done a number of assessments and occasionally finding somebody meet the criteria, I, I can't say to you, Al, that every person that I diagnosed with psychopathy, I knew it the minute I sat down by looking in their no, eyes. Of course, but of I course. will tell you, this guy, mm. yes. Mm. But I meant like the difference between those two dudes would appear in the eyes of the of the sociopath you mentioned and the psychopath. I'm I'm just imagining that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, there was because a because he, here's the reasoning: if you're a psychopath, like you described here, you have to be much more interested in mapping what's going on, uh, on around you, so that you can use that. You said chess piece. That's an excellent. Whereas if you're just a sociopathic brute, you're kind of more disconnected to, you know, you're giving, you're not giving a damn as much about, oh, something is in my way. Okay. I want to, <laughs> I want to remove that. But otherwise that, that's just how I imagine it. Uh, I have no clue, but is there something to this? I, I th- well, I think yes and no in the sense that, you know, just because somebody was, you know, became a sociopath, I don't think they're necessarily always a brute. I mean, oh, okay. the guy that I'm thinking about wasn't really a brute in terms of, certainly in terms of his behavior himself. He was brutal right. in terms of some of the things he ordered. He made other people do the, the Right. Yeah. But he was mm. very smart, mm. very calculated. Um, now, again, I think some of his, the people who were underneath him were pretty brutal yeah. and brutes, maybe, if you want to use that term. The guy, that, the second guy, the one that I hypothesize was a psychopath. Yeah. Um, definitely had a certain kind of deadness to his eyes. Mm. Even though he was very charming, kind of an attractive guy, very ingratiating. Um, like I said very, very smooth. Mm. Very much, very again, somebody that you could just see if he teamed up with somebody, it was very calculated, strategic. There was no attachment. Right. So if you had to be locked in a room alone with one of them, you would go for the sociopath. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> because you were not threat to him, so you'd probably leave you alone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's move on. This was a little childish detour, but I, I think it's fun. Sure. Now, um, you touched it. We have small scale versus big scale cases or conditions. And it's so interesting because everybody understands and recognizes that this is something it's a phenomenon out there it's going on and oh you have to beware and i'm going to ask you uh, soon enough about you know science in in family and friends and and your personal Perfect. environment but these people get but they do not get that if one of these guys or good gals are intelligent enough they will ascend to power and if Psychopaths, fortunately, if you write, there's only maximum 1% about, uh, floating about. But no matter, it's still many jobs or, or positions in society they can ascend to to, to uh, play out their psychopathy. And nothing would, you know, the, the greatest price is the most power. Yes. And so... Uh, I think, you know, for example, becoming a president, although you can debate how much power they really have, but uh, at least narcissists would be very attracted to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, p- But people don't get it that our rulers are, 
you know, it, it may be 1% if you take 100 random people. But if you go for the positions that appeal to psychopaths and narcissists, the number has to be much higher. And and this is the dangerous thing because these are the clever ones that doesn't necessarily do violence themselves like those you work with. These are the ones who generate violence. And look at the world today, man. Wars, even torture is done by the system. Uh, un untold sufferings going on. Like, like right now in this pandemic, people are losing their homes. They are getting sick. Mm. They are l losing their money. They are losing their health care. And you have politicians who decide to give themselves more money or to give the corporations and the uh, uh, those who already have much more money. I mean, this psychopathy is ruling. Uh, somehow, we managed to make a world where psychopathic values are systematized so that, uh, and no more is it visible than in the corporate world. In the corporate world, psychopathic principles are the name of the game. And that's a perfect thing uh, for psychopaths because then normal people will have to adjust would have to kind of play along with the psychopathic rules and psychopaths won't be busted because they will just be good workers or good uh, players they're just doing what they're supposed to do so they won't be smoked out so it's like psychopaths have taken over the world and designed it i'm sorry for this dystopian outburst but it's <laughs> i think there's something to what i'm saying here what's your thought as a psychologist about this because i, I think too many psychologists are just concerned about the small scale individual easy to see cases but not so much the sociological the bigger analysis but i'm sure as you know, normal human beings you must entertain these things and think about it well it's interesting because you know as psychologists that really is our training al we really are trained to kind of focus on the individual right that's yeah. kind of our, our our space and so i think we are less likely unless you're a social psychologist to right take a step back and kind of try to look at the bigger picture I think for me, you know, with that individual focus, I think what becomes a little confusing to me, and you alluded to that, is that one of the things, and I, I don't know how it is in Norway, you'll have to, to educate me, but here in the United States, we are very much an individualistic country, meaning we tend to focus on the individual for, for better and worse. Yeah. There's the whole American dream, right? You can, you know, everything is due to effort. You know, if, if you right. don't succeed, it's because you didn't try hard enough. It's not because of any other reason, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I think because of that, we in our country have overlooked the power of a situation to influence behavior. Right. And so we are very quickly to judge other people. There's been a tons of research to show that, that if I see somebody doing something that I think is is not right, I will almost always attribute that, if I don't think about it, to that person's personality or character. Mm. I am very rarely going to say, okay, what's going on in that person's environment? What's going on in that person's life that would lead him or her to look at that? So I, I say that just because it becomes confusing to me to step back and kind of look at that big picture like you're talking about and kind of go, okay, we, we know statistically that maybe two to 5% of the people in the United States have would meet the criteria for psychopathy. And yet if you're saying like you are and I've heard, you're not alone, mm that we're seeing these psychopathic corporations, then what does that mean? Does it mean it's being run by psychopaths and it's trickling down? Or are we saying that it's a path for advancement, which I, I think you're saying all these things, that people who are psychopathic are going to rise to the top? Yeah. How much of an individual's behavior is the situation they're involved in? And then what do you do if you're in that situation? Mm. You know, Because there, there probably are many people – you know, I'm I'm not in corporate America. I tend to be more obviously in correctional America. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I don't see some of the things that I hear about, which what you're saying, I do hear about those. You know, how much of that, you know, how, so I, I'm sure there are plenty of people who probably have pretty good morals and values who behave psychopathically. They're trapped in the system. Yeah, exactly. In the system, because that's the way to kind of get up. I tend to focus on the individual, I think, because that's my training and also because when you step back, you kind of go, okay, what do we do with this? Mm. What do we do with this? I mean, we can vote, right? We should. We can we can pass laws, which we should. We can teach our, our children values, which we should. We can encourage people to start their own businesses or to get out of corporate America, which maybe we should. 
it's easier for me to focus on the individual because I feel like I can help this person. I can change this person. But, but I think psychology becomes politics. Like, like me, for example, mm. I'm totally on the antitrust bandwagon. You know, break them up, mm. create small businesses, small scale, let, let it be under people control. But the problem, I think, is that when you have phenomena such as psychopathy, narcissism, it's not transferred to the collective specter. It's not recognized. You can see these values in individuals and you can say, well, well, this is wrong. This is pathological. This is even criminal. But they don't do it on the social psychology level, mm -hmm. so to speak. And that's, I think, is a big problem because then we, yeah, we, we became the herd and a psychopathic structure probably also overrepresented with psych psychopathic individuals become the shepherds. I think this is a big problem. You are not alone in terms of, of that sentiment. <laughs> I mean, look and at Epstein and all that stuff. I, I think there, I think there are people who would say that. I'm sure there are people who would say that. You know, if you have a capitalist society, is that going to a Catholic encourage? Yeah, you know, yeah, capitalism. You know, where it's the whole oh, capitalism. So survive, capitalism, yeah, the survival of the fittest, and you again that whole individualist perspective. Is that in and of itself going to encourage people to kind of walk over other people to to you know pit themselves against them to step on them etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean no you can say that of every ideology you can always yeah, find I, that, ways that's certainly beyond my scope of, yeah. of of knowledge but you know the studies very interesting studies that shows that and this is a fact folks the richer you get in terms of financial wealth the less empathy you get and and it is not just like a generational thing it's in an individual you can track an individual take the classical american dream thing uh, you started out in a you were poor and you had to struggle and blah 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 and somehow you made it okay well then you can track that the empathy uh, goes down I, i guess you can explain it also by the fact that uh, poor people have to be more social care more socially because they more rely upon each other to get by Definitely. whereas When you get insane amounts of wealth, I'm not just talking about well off middle class people. I'm thinking about ex insane, extreme wealth. You have it's like the old saying: power corrupts. Uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and you can just transfer that to to wealth. So you have people like Jeff Bezos, who is soon to become the first trillionaire, <laughs> and his his employers has to walk around with uh, diapers. Horrible. I, I think it's very interesting for psychology because there's lesson to be learned here in order to un to understand what's going on. Because if we can change people, just such co basic conditions, no wonder oligarchs are heartless and you know portrayed as evil. <laughs> it's something well, happening you know, what's, here. What's interesting about that, though, Al, I think is that okay, money is in and of itself is a neutral, right? Right. I mean, there's nothing inherently evil about no, money. No, no, So then it becomes, what are the attitudes that go along with that? You know, what what is it about having money or getting money right. mm. that changes somebody's perception? Or is it the fact that they had those values already and they just become exaggerated as they get, as they get more removed from poverty or whatever? Right. Now, now they can live it out. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I hear you. Mm -hmm. That's important questions. Okay, all this is interesting, but let's move on. By the way, I, I really appreciate your ability to give uh, short and precise answers here, because that makes right. it makes it possible to go, go through my list of uh, topics. Although <laughs> I hope people will forgive us for, of course, we can't examine it as deep as as needed, but you can ask Alex; he will confirm that. I really prefer delving deep and it's not possible to do with one show such a huge topic as we are taking on. So this is just an initial sure. scratching, but at least it gives us some ideas. Now, we have talked a little about potential causations, so I think we we could say we're good there. Okay. Uh, although, is there something that jumps out when it comes to causation? Like there, there is different theories, but uh, is there something worth adding there before we move on? Like, like, what about brain damage? Oh. Could that be an element here? There have been some studies that show that in certain parts of the brain, like the amygdala and certain parts of the brain that kind of house fear responses, that you can see differences in children earlier on and in, in adults who've been diagnosed with psychopathy. That part of the brain is under aroused. 
Hmm. And there's been some studies to show that um, individuals with psychopathy also are less likely to recognize fear responses in the faces of others. So there is definitely some evidence to suggest that there may be some of this underlying emotional deficits or like under recognition or under appreciation of fear, not only in other people, but in terms of feeling it. Hmm. And um, there's some uh, like there seems to be this under arousal that occurs in, in certain individuals who, again, end up being done as psychopathy, which, again, does argue that there is certainly some kind of either structural, again, or genetic or some biological component that sets the stage for this particular disorder to develop. Hmm. Okay. Uh, you talked about uh, a genetic component, um, but if it's like a damage of some sort, I mean, the chances for every generation having it that's not how genetics works. But, but, but if it manifests in the, let's say the father, then the behavioral heritage will be transferred. So you can't tell the difference, right? I think some of the, and again, we're so, we're such babies, really, and looking <laughs> at some of the biological components. There's all kinds of theories about some biological components to, to psychopathy. And you're right. When you're talking about a parent passing it along, well, then it becomes okay if the, the parent has the, is contributing half the nature, but what about mm. the nurture as well? So the studies that have been done obviously try to look at um, children who were adopted at birth and right. looking at, you know, okay, here's somebody who shared 50% genes with this person but wasn't raised by this person. Um, and there do seem to be some studies that show, for example, that at least criminal behavior and some predispositions do are more likely to occur yeah. in biological parents with, uh, you know, with the, with the kids who were raised with adoptive families. Yeah. So there seems to be some evidence that it's not just the way they were parented. Right. There seems to be something that's there. But again, it's never a destiny thing. There's always no, no. it's always more complicated than that. Yeah. So if you know, if you expect 20 percent, you know, if it was if it had no impact, you might get 28 percent. I'm making this up you yeah. know, but, or 35 percent. So you get there's some evidence to suggest, yeah, there seems to be something that's passed down, whether it's some temperament, some predisposition, some under arousal, something seems to be passed down because it's happening more in these adoptive kids um, than we would expect. But it doesn't mean it's happening in most of these adoptive kids. Mm. Yeah, and, and um, I bet an interesting thing would also be twin studies, if they are not raised in the same household. Yeah. But I guess study cases are hard. In fact, studying this, especially psychopathy, is kind of scary because, like you pointed out, and it's a very good point, it's easier for the health system to pick up narcissism and BPD Whereas usually the criminal system picks up sociopathy and uh, psychopathy, but that would be the stupid versions, <laughs> you know, the less capable, less sophisticated yeah. manifestations of it. So to study a sophisticated psychopath, it, it's like, in my view, it's, it's, we know it's there, but it's very airy fairy. It's like it's slipping through your fingers. It could just be a, like a myth almost. <laughs> It is very, very challenging. I mean, it, yeah. that's what's challenging to look at, you know, prevalence and how do we know what the prevalence is? I mean, how do we, because we have to look at people who've been diagnosed. Well, how do people get diagnosed? Yeah. They enter the mental health system or the end the criminal justice system. And you're right. What about people who don't enter, enter either one of those? So, so, so the numbers could be much bigger than we are aware of, because if you're intelligent, you're not getting caught, right? I, I think that. Yes, yes, that's a short answer. They definitely could be. I don't think that they're probably half the population or no, anything like that. No, not that bad, of course. But, but um, but it it certainly is, you know, is possible. I think we have to, you know, look at the prevalence of other personality disorders, and I think you know, four to ten percent is when you look at the population of in the United States of people who have been diagnosed or believed to have personality disorders. This is all the personality disorders. You get four to 15%. That's a huge spread 
uh, which kind of means we don't know exactly how many right people would meet that criteria. All per, you mean all these four personal or all yeah. that exist? All personality disorders. There are ten personality disorders in the DSM five. And it's only fifteen percent. Yes. I think because, that's a low number in today's society. Well, it, it might be, but you have to think that these are extreme. Right, right. right? right. These are extreme situations. Yes. And they're extreme examples. These are, these are people who are exhibiting these, you know, personality traits that are causing distress in all er- or dysfunction, yeah. not necessarily distress, in all areas of their life or in multiple areas of their life, not just somebody who's, you know, going through – a bad phase or is a jerk at work, mm. but is loving at home, right? I mean, so they're, they're, by definition, they are the more extreme examples. Yeah, good point. Uh, I, I think dysfunction is the clue because that's how you get picked up by either system, health or crime. So, um, so there may be much. <laughs> <laughs> more sick of people out there just getting by. I mean, people can do a very easy thought experiment. Let me ask you, how many approximately, if there is even a federal norm, maybe it's a state norm, but how many people would you expect in a school class in America per teacher? How many? Like is it 30 pupils and one teacher or 20 pupils? And right, no, I get, I get that part of it. So you're yeah. saying how many... Psychopaths? Would you no, no, just how many is it in a class in America? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, you just mean in like, the number. Yeah. So yeah, people. Thirty. Let's say thirty is probably a good number. Thirty. Okay. It's it's not very different from here. So I think most people I've talked with, not everybody. So so it may not be because if it's one of thirty, um, most people agree that one of these disorders manifest in about at least one person in a school class. Okay. And that tells you, I mean, it's completely anecdotal, <laughs> but I mean, people have that impression at least. And that tells you, no, not every class you've been in, but most people have encountered someone in their life. And of course, the big problem is if it's in the family. What, what would be uh, an advice for people who are affected? So I think it would be somewhat dependent upon what the problem is, but I will say a couple of different things. I mean, one thing, and this might be not what you're expecting, but mm-hmm. I think almost the biggest gift we can give ourselves is to know ourselves, to know our buttons, to know our strengths, to know our vulnerabilities. And to know our limits Mm. and to consistently communicate those because so much of the time I I see individuals and and, and not that they are. It's never a victim's fault to get involved with someone who Mm. is pretending to be somebody that he or she is not for whatever reason. Mm. Sometimes, though, I think it's the vulnerabilities that we have. At the time. Oh, right. That can attract people that, like that. Exactly. Well, mm. or, and that can make it harder to either recognize it or to get out of it. Mm. And so as opposed to focusing, because, you know, so much of the time, and I will always say, and you're doing a huge service, I think, to your audience. Always say, look, read about, you know, manipulation. Mm. You know, read about how people scheme other people. You know, be, be aware Read about personality disorders, read about dysfunctional behavior, read, but, but most importantly, know yourself first. Mm. Um, if you're in a vulnerable situation, if you're just going through a divorce, if you had a loss, I mean, we're all more vulnerable in those situations, you know, make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Uh, and they prey especially upon vulnerable people because they know it's going to be less resistance. Vulnerable, not just vulnerable people, but people in vulnerable situations. Right. You know, my this is a kind of an odd example, but my daughter went to college a year ago, and there is a, it, it, colleges are a huge recruiting ground for cults. Cults, huge wow. for cults, yeah, for yeah, you know, for religious cults. Wow, I didn't and you know kind that. of go, why? Of course, right? Yeah, it's, it's logical. Of course, mm. why would it? Because I mean, how vulnerable are freshman college students? Who are away from home for the first time. Yeah, and they're, and they're seeking. They're, they're still seeking. They're not set in there, fixed in there. They're, they're lonely. Yeah. 
It makes sense. They're isolated, yeah. right, from their families. Mm, they're, yeah. it, it's a, it, I mean, so it's a, tra- it's a time of transition. So these aren't necessarily vulnerable kids in terms of their personalities or their psyches, but they're in a vulnerable right. time in their life. Yeah. And there are times when every single one of us, we are in a vulnerable position, whether it's because we lost somebody that we love through death, because we had a relationship breakup because we've moved to somewhere else um, because we're super lonely. And we are in that, in that, at that time, we are more vulnerable. Did, did someone try to recruit her? No, no, no. But, but it's interesting. She, she did. I mean, of course, you know me, bless her heart. She's like had every <laughs> warning known to me. So she, she was well equipped. Predators hit faults. You know? I mean, yeah. That's what happens when your mom is a psychologist, but um, right, right. or a forensic psychologist. But I will tell you that, on her, on that university, that college Facebook page for parents, mm-hmm. a woman the first week, and she did it again this year, put this huge post about her daughter getting recruited into a cult at this university. But do and they let in people like Scientology and stuff into a university? I, I, I mean, isn't it a closed environment? Well, it, no, I mean, these are just people who walk around well, right. the university. Yeah, they already have some minions and they spread it. right? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Mm. And, and and sadly, this woman who apparently has kind of made it her mission to help or to protect other children because her daughter is still involved in this cult three years later. Wow. And every single year, this woman goes on this Facebook page and says, if you have a freshman, please mm. be aware of this group. And I mean, she will name names. And so, mm. so again, I give that as an example, not about our topic today, although, yes, I, I guess it is relevant to our topic today in the well, sense sure. that. It's very important, I think, for all of us, starting with knowing, again, knowing ourselves when we're vulnerable, making sure we have people in our lives that we can trust and that we do trust and, you know, and taking care of ourselves and knowing, again, knowing our values, knowing our boundaries um, and not making excuses for other people, which I see happen over and over again for various reasons. Yeah. And, the, you know, if we can do all those That's things. That's en- enablers. They, they do it. It's like children of alcoholics. They attack uh those who criticize rather than the problem itself. Absolutely. And again, it's it's not saying that, that it, there's anything wrong with the person. It's just saying, you know, we all can be in vulnerable situations. And, mm. you know, and if we have a history of trauma, sometimes it becomes more difficult to notice somebody who's a predator, emotionally, mm. pre- an emotional predator or a physical predator. Um, so the more we can take, you know, the more we can be informed about, you know, again, dysfunctional behavior or predatory behavior. And then, but the more we can know ourselves again and, you know, and our boundaries and our strengths and our vulnerabilities and our weaknesses and build up kind of those protections with other, you know, with having people that we trust, having a resource that we can go to if we need, if we're not sure about something. It doesn't mean somebody isn't going to take advantage of us, but it means we're going to recognize it sooner and get out of it. Yes, and it's a very good point about cults. The, uh, I would put them next to corporations. There's many manifestations of psychopathy, organized psychopathy, or the, that vibe in the world on a collective basis, and cults are obviously one of those. But it's easy, you know, for cults, because that's something else, some intruding force. What about if you're stuck with, the, let's say, in your family, mm. or if, you know, the your your spouse uh, or, or, the, or the one parent of your child, you know, some uh, say that you should, uh, there's nothing you can do, especially not with psychopaths. They say the same about narcissists. Mm-hmm. They say, just cut them out. Just, you know, run while there's still time. Well, there's something to be said for that. Um, you know, I think to expect somebody who's been the same way for many years to change is is optimistic, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> um, Kindly put, yeah. Um, I think, again, you know, one of the things I always say is because I used to have people come in my office all the time when I was doing therapy and I understand this, but they'd come in and they'd focus on the other person. And what I would say is, okay, let's focus on you because the stronger you are, then you can right. decide, Good point. cut this person out of your life. If it's somebody that you think is psychopathic, you don't have to diagnose that person. You can look at the behavior toward, right? That's right. what we need to focus on. Yeah. I, it doesn't matter to me if my husband is a psychopath or a narcissist or a borderline or whatever, if he's mistreating me, Mm. Right. The reason doesn't matter. Yes. If he's yes. lying yes. to me over and over again, if he's cheating on me over and over again, mm. if he's 
physically hurting me in some respects, if he's psychologically uh, hurting me in some respects, I don't need to diagnose that person, right? I need to set limits and respond. And if that means that person is going to be out of my life, then so be it. So this is also ways to recognize what you just, because that was a question too, what you just listed are ways to recognize. But then you have the dynamics. You know how in some relationships, and it doesn't only have to be love relationships, but obviously it's more prevalent there, that it becomes a dynamic where Mm -hmm. destruction goes both ways and they can't cope. Uh, I guess if one person is pathological and the other isn't, you can still have get the situation where both of them are doing psychopathical behavior. Well, and there's there's no question that, you know, there are relationships that are so toxic for whatever reason that, you know, even if one person is, quote, pathological and the other person is not, they end up getting in this system where they're both acting yeah. pathologically. And that's when I kind of bring it back to if you are in a relationship with somebody who is unhealthy for you for whatever reason, whether you're contributing to it or not, get help for yourself. Yeah. So if you have a son or you have a daughter, I mean, I'm thinking of for myself with four kids. If I had a son or a daughter that I felt like had a personality disorder um, or was like, you know, was very was unhealthy for me or unhealthy, I would get help for myself first because that situation alone would be so devastating and stressful to me. And that person, if I trust my therapist or trust my, you know, whatever it is, it could be your minister or you need to get some help for yourself. That would ha- help me figure out, do I need to get this person out of my life? Mm. Yeah. And if I don't want to, then how do I set those limits and those boundaries so that that relationship. Yeah. Boundaries are super exactly, important. So that yes. relationship yes. does mm. not adversely impact me any more than it, than it needs to. Mm. And and your advice about starting with yourself is also applying here because then you may uh, prevent getting uh, dragged down the drain where both of you are being toxic. In fact, if you end up in in the system somehow with a, a, a real psychopath or someone, let's say, with strong psychopathical traits because you say it's a specter, right? So it's not a black or white, but yes. then you're almost doomed to lose because <laughs> that other person isn't playing by the rules, man. Well, and I would be the first. <laughs> and, and will outplay you. <laughs> exactly. And I, I mean, I would be, let me cut to the chase. I mean, yeah. if, if somebody came to me or I knew somebody and they said, I am with somebody and this person has been diagnosed with psychopathy, and it was a friend of mine, the first thing I would say would be get out, right. get away. Right. The problem is they're, they're not getting uh, diagnosed with it so much. So, exactly. And yeah. that's the hard thing. And that's why so, so much of the time, you know, I, I get so many um, emails from people like on my Psychology Day blog and they, they're, they're, they're kind of asking me, to off, and I understand this, mm. they, to diagnose somebody. You know, I'm with this person. This person's doing A, B, and C. Is he a narcissist, right, or right. is she a psychopath, or is she borderline, or whatever? Mm. And that's why, I, you know, obviously, I can never diagnose somebody I've not evaluated, and that's the first thing I always say. But the bigger picture is, again, does it matter? Mm. In the sense that focus, you know, get help for yourself, and fo- focus on the behavior that you're seeing. Yeah. Right. Focus on behavior. And that's the whole point of psychology. Yes. And self-help. Uh, we're pressed for time. Uh, okay. Two quick questions at the end here that you can on- answer pretty uh, quick. Okay. First, are there any potential cures or treatment for these? Obviously, there is for BPD, but these three others. And I know the problem is they are not interested in, they don't recognize. But let's say somehow you tricked or, or you motivated or convinced someone <laughs> to, yeah, let's try this. Would there be anything we could do? Um, I think that there is, I don't know of an effective treatment Mm. for psychopathy currently. Mm. I think we are struggling with that. If somebody else knows it out there, I'd love to hear about it. But I'm not aware of there being any treatment. As a matter of fact, there's been some studies that suggest that if you put somebody who is psychopathic in treatment, they just become a better psychopath. Um, So... That part of it, I have yet, and I think that's why we've we've kind of shifted our gears toward looking at maybe warning signs in children so that we can intervene then because we feel so stuck 
um, when you have an adult who's psychopathic to, to figure out how to help that person. So that's kind of my answer to that question. Mm-hmm. We've talked about borderline personality disorder, and there is uh, there's a particular form of treatment called dialectical behavioral therapy, which seems to be uh, really effective. Um, with individuals with borderline personality disorder. So that's very good news, I think. Yeah. Because you're right, when I was in school, it really was like, if somebody had a personality disorder, then forget it. I mean, that's just, that's just, that, that's it. We can't do anything with that person, and that's not mm-hmm. true anymore. Yeah. Um, with, with narcissism. With narcissism, again, the, the, the primary problem, as you've already mentioned, is the motivation for treatment. Yeah. Um, but there have been individuals, I think, who have, and I think this is relatively rare, who have gotten into treatment, even sometimes into court-ordered treatment, and have, over a long period of time, been able to at least change some of the behaviors. Yeah. This psychologist so, I mentioned to you, I think he's one of them. Uh-huh. He, he talks about treatment for, for it because he has it himself. Okay. So, I and I have, again, I have a colleague who has worked with individuals with um, NPD, and I'm thinking of a person that she was telling me about who really got into treatment just because he was very, um, very attached to his wife. Mm. He, he was very attached, even though their relationship was extremely one sided and everything kind of revolved around him. But he was very underneath, very dependent upon her. And she basically said, after you know many years, I'm leaving you. I can't do this anymore. And he was motivated. He got into treatment very, very initially, I think, to just show her that he did it. Yeah. So she would leave him. Yeah. Um, but over a long period of time, I think he learned, I think, how to engage with her differently, at least from a behavioral perspective. Yeah. Um, he almost trained himself mm-hmm. to be more inquiring of her, you know, more interested in her. And, um, you know, I think over time began to look at some of his underlying uh, feelings of, as we talked about earlier, you know, kind of inferiority and low self-esteem and how he was always compensating by being incredibly grandiose and self-centered on the surface and how that really was not serving him well anymore. Mm. But I think it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. Is, uh, do we have any idea of what uh, the cost is for society for these uh, disorders? <sighs> I'm not even sure how we'd begin to measure that. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing is prison, of course, but and then there's crimes. No, the, it can't be measured. I agree. Um, it, yeah, it can't be measured. Yeah. It really can't. Um, most people involved in the prison system are not. They have not been diagnosed with a, you know, any kind of psychiatric disorder. I don't think the cause of all crime is. A psychiatric disorder. No, of course. So it just becomes very, yeah, it just becomes difficult to think how you measure that. No, 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 I agree. Um, But but (laughs) I mentioned this crazy uh, doctor who, 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 well, he said he had NPD. But I I remember when I was a student, it was like a common um, truism that those who studied psychology, who went to that faculty, they had there was something wrong with them, and they wanted to fix it. <laughs> that was the primary motivation. Yeah, the crazy psychologist stereotype. Yeah, that's the first motivation. Yes. But my point is, I doubt if psychology would probably be one of the few subjects that wouldn't interest psychopaths or, or narcissists. Or, or am I wrong? Or could it be the I opposite? I don't know about that. I don't because. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm certainly not aware of any statistics about psychopathy and mental health professionals as a profession, but... I mean, wouldn't they feel threatened by the whole thing to map the psyche if they know there's something wrong with them? I th- On the other hand, they, they could be motivated by understanding how it works and abuse it, of course. You have that. Well, and, and I think I was going to say that. I mean, mm. I think that, you know, being a therapist is a position of power. Right although we don't think of it that way necessarily. And I don't think most therapists go into it thinking that. But, of course, when you're in, in a therapy session, that person's t- telling you everything about course, them, right? Yes, you're not yes. telling them much about you at all. No, no. So that in and of itself, they're coming to you for help or for advice. Again, that in and of itself makes it somewhat of an unequal relationship. So I could see how that might be appealing to... Especially forensics where you're working because you have uh, maybe more than the judge. You have an influence you know, in court cases and stuff over people's uh, face. I, no, I think if I was, you know, if we're doing one of our little hypothetical things again, but yeah. I was sitting here thinking, I'm thinking if I was a psychopath 
Mm-hmm. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't want to be in forensics. I'd want to be a, a clinician because <laughs> that. And there have been a couple of criminal cases uh-huh. where I'm thinking of one in New Zealand where a, this psych, psychiatrist who ended up murdering his wife, poisoning her, Jeez. and almost getting away with it, was clearly a psychopath. Right. And after he, you know, kind of, they just kind of eventually, he had fooled everybody, everybody, his colleagues. And he was a psychiatrist, right? He was a psychiatrist. Oh, yeah. I, I know that that's a good job for them. So I could see that I don't think necessarily that that would be at the bottom of the list of professions. I mean, I could see. No, no, but I think psychiatry would be much more popular for them than psychology. Because uh, in psychiatry, you can just go- use the drugs to dope them down. In psychology, you have to, oh, all this, oh, you have to learn all these theories and then you have to apply them. It's hard work, man. It's You have to be oh, motivated by something no. else than uh, by selfishness. I'm just thinking. But it's an interesting thought experiment. We won't solve it here today, but something to think about at least. For sure. Mm-hmm. Now, before you leave here, just give us your, uh, for example, you've done books. Tell us about them. Well, I've just, I've done a couple of books. It's been a while since I've done one. I have one coming out relatively soon, which is kind of a true crime question and answer book, which is pretty, it was kind of fun. It's called Serial Killers, 101 Questions True Crime Fans Ask. Wow. Um, um, Because I do so much research in that area. Serial killers. So we're talking Bundy and stuff like that? Mm Mm-hmm. That's why Alex has been going on about Bundy lately. Okay. (laughs) So um, that's psychopathy, isn't it? I definitely, yes, I definitely think that he would meet that criteria. Um, and I think probably most serial killers would. Um. But I, I'll tell you this short now. They won't be out to the public probably, probably eight, nine months from now. So your book will be out by then. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, I, I'm glad you said that because my book will be out. If I ever finish editing it, then it will be. So that's <laughs> a, a goal of mine. So I will make sure I have it out by then for sure. Both of you are in frantic Ugh. editing mode right now, right? We are. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So that's my latest project. And then, I, as you know, Al, I do my Psychology Today blog called The Human Equation, which I love because I get so much great feedback from yeah. people who read the, the column. And then, A million articles, folks. Check them out. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'd lo- I probably spend too much time writing, but I, I, I love it. So I justify it. <laughs> we, have a, we have a very high amount of readers in our audience. Oh. So that's not a problem here. Great. Yeah, so they can go to Psychology Today and they can search for your um, subcategory, right? Yep. To find your stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then just a, a couple of other things. I and, mean, of course, I spend a lot of time in prisons, as I mentioned. So I work with a lot of attorneys as well as a lot of um, judges and, and do parole evaluations and those kind of things. That's kind of more of my, my day job. But then I have a podcast called The Forensic Psychologist, and then I have a YouTube channel called Unmasking a Murderer. So. Oh, so those are different. They are different. Those are not the same. Nope. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, but don't you put your podcasts out on YouTube too? You know, I probably should. Um, <laughs> yeah. I am like the worst podcaster. I was telling you before. Yeah. I just, you know, I just do what I when I can when I get to it. And my audiences are a little bit different. My forensic psychologist art, um, audience is, tends to be more people who are interested in like psychology, more like the ideas of psychology and, and, and crime, whereas my unmasking a murderer, we talk about that, but we talk about a, a case and then analyze it. Is that for YouTube, unmasking the murderer? That's for YouTube. Yeah, that's that's clever because 75% of YouTubers are male. I didn't realize that. <laughs> that's what they say. Oh. So I guess they will be more interested in the murder case. Uh, by the way, what's the, what's, uh, the opposite of um, uh, in, in the court? You have a, a defend lawyer. What's the opposite of the other prosecutor? Yeah, I bet there's a lot of psychopaths among the prosecutors. Interesting. <laughs> That's my stereotypical uh, speculation. Now, see, I would think, and again, I would yeah? think that you would have more psychopaths who are defense attorneys. Really? To help people? Mm-hmm. To defend them? Because, you know, there's the whole beat the system part, right, of right. being a defense attorney. Um, in the United States, and you're, you never ask your client if they're guilty or innocent, and your job is just to kind of get them off. And right. so I would think there would be more of a challenge yeah. with that. But you know, To, to get all the psychopaths off. Or, um, exactly. Yeah. That's what I would think. But again, this is – who knows? 
Yeah, well, it may be some kind of self-interest. You know, unselfishness is, at the end of the game, the ultimate egoism. Mm. Because if you really are an intelligent egotist, you realize, Jesus, I have to help as many poor people as possible. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so there is some kind of uh, bonding between pedophiles we see, this Epstein times and all that stuff. Mm. Maybe there's some kind of unspoken codex or bond between psychopaths too. I don't know. Who knows how they work? But if they realize they are psychopaths and they can recognize others, maybe there's some kind of sympathy there. Although I would think maybe there's competition too. Probably. Yeah, maybe the judge is a real psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. That, those are some interesting things. That th you have raised such interesting questions to think about. Great, even though we were very basic today. But you've been a good sport coming on. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Yes, and it's not every day I get to talk with Ashley Judd's twin sister. <laughs> <laughs> that alone was worth coming on right. for, just a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed you even knew who, who she was, so that's cool. <laughs> But uh, no, I think we've all learned uh, a little more today. I'm going to okay. explore the, uh, these topics d deeper in the future. So this was just, you know, the initial feel. I may have this uh, narcissist on too. Uh, if I do, I, I'm going to send you the link for that. I would love that. I would love <laughs> that. It would be interesting, right? So, but I, uh, you have to flee. So it just uh, remains to thank you so much for giving us your time of day. You're welcome. And your expertise. Yeah. You're welcome, Alan. Thank you for your flexibility, and so I appreciate it. Well, uh, I'll, I'll let, let you, you go, go now, but okay, uh, give my best to, to Alex. I will. Thanks so much, Alan. It was fun. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye. And thanks again to Dr. Johnston for walking us through the basics of these ailments. I'm going to share with you now some quotes about them. But first, let me remind you that if you enjoy our shows and want to support us but can't afford it, God knows in this economic depression, it's fully understandable. In fact, I'd say if you're not American, <laughs> you, you should donate because you can afford it because you haven't been hurt as much. But if you're American, I totally get it. Five trillions in a bailout to the corporations who didn't even need it and the oligarchs and a trillion a day to the stock market and nothing to the people except being thrown out of your house, getting infected by the pandemic and losing your job. So and, and you don't even have health care. So it's very hard to be American these days. So my heart goes out to you. So, but th there's a way you can support us. Play the ads at YouTube. If, I mean, you may not be listening to YouTube, but if you do, let the ads play out. And then evil Google can <laughs> pay us instead of you. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, do remember to subscribe. We are having many more viewers than subscribers. It's as if people have stopped subscribing these days after YouTube uh, screwed up everything with a new algorithm so please subscribe and click the bell it really helps uh, us to have as many subscribers as possible very important in today's uh, in, in this field without many subscribers you'll get nowhere and this also goes for a podcast channel or new podcast channel that many people don't even know we have check us out itunes Google Podcasts, Spotify, whatever they're all called. Uh, you'll find us anywhere and subscribe there too. We need many more subscribers there. And now for some words about these personality disorders. First, Tracy Malone, who had a mother who was a narcissist, has some interesting quotes. She says, Narcissists are sexual vampires. Just like a vampire needs blood and cares not where he gets it, a narcissist thinks he is not being unfaithful because he really didn't commit to you. If it's an act, it doesn't count. And you will do 90% of everything in a relationship. The 10% the narcissist give is only when they want something. Do not seek your worth in someone else. Your worth is inside you. Realize this and then find a partner worthy of you. Never stay if they do not know your worth. Some solid advice there, of course, applies to any partner, not just narcissists. But uh, it kind of boils down to also what Joni says. Know thyself. 
this age old adage is so true in all things psychological and philosophical and it's interesting to notice that most psychological ailments are connected to a distortion in the self a dissonance in the self so know it heal it and develop it Uh, i have some quotes here that i don't know the source of anonymous i guess One is, narcissists are great con artists. After all, they succeed in deluding themselves. As a result, very few professionals see through them. And this one, someone who is capable of leaving you without a real heart-to-heart talk basically lacks empathy and is manipulative. Some people, most often those with NPD or traits of it, purposely leave relationships denying their partners the decency and respect of closure. Why? It boils down to one thing and one thing only, control. And this one, most people think NPD is about self-love, but there is a flip side to it. It is unrequited self-love. Narcissus weeps to find that his image does not return his love. And Voltaire said, It is not love that should be depicted as blind, but self-love. Shannon Adler says, Narcissists will never tell you the truth. They live with a fear of abandonment and can't deal with facing their own shame. Therefore, they will twist the truth, downplay their behavior, blame others and say whatever it takes to remain the victim. They are master manipulators and con artists that don't believe you are smart enough to figure out the depths of their disloyalty. Their needs will always be more important than telling you any truth that isn't in their favor. Mm. I see that some of these traits also apply to BPD. Speaking of BPD, John Duffy says, Research has also revealed that women who have developed PTSD in relation to early childhood sexual abuse often develop borderline personality disorder. Kira Van Gelder, who who suffers from uh, BPD, BD says, I'm so good at beginnings, but in the end, I always seem to destroy everything, including myself. Dr. Catherine Ramsland has some brilliant insights into psychopathy. She says, whether male or female, the psychopathic brain differs anatomically from a non-psychopathic brain. Let's pause here. I have to comment because oh, I forgot to bring this up to Joni, but they have discovered that psychopaths doesn't understand metaphors now that i find interesting in fact that alone means that you will find less psychopaths in the area of esoterics because to them it will be gibberish nonsense unintelligible and esoteric realities deeply Um, are relying upon the analogic way of developing. So that's a way to flush them out, actually. They're often literalists, and indeed we find among fundamentalists. So there's probably many more psychopaths among fundamentalists. I I don't care if it's a religious fundamentalist, a skeptical fundamentalist, etc. Any kind of literalism. Uh, But Dr. Ramsland goes on to say, Psychopaths are not all violent, but when they are, they tend to be cruel and criminally diverse. They repeat their crimes more often than non-psychopathic offenders. They're more destructive and their offenses are primarily those that involve self-gain. Many are predatory, acutely attuned to their own advantage. Psychopaths are typically attracted to jobs involving power, status, excitement and money. We don't expect them to be nurses, yet some do target the most vulnerable victims, easily found in healthcare facilities. Even there, there they might not be who, who we think. Callous and opportunistic, female psychopaths are a rarer breed. Though they share much with their male counterparts, they may be even better equipped to elude detection. Some female psychopathic offenders show symptoms of other conditions as well. There appears to be a link especially between psychopathy and BPD, borderline, which is characterized by emotional instability, impulsive behavior and unstable relationships. Uh, 
P.R. Spears says, The sign of sociopathy are usually there before we are abused. Most of us just don't know enough to recognize them. Amy Thomas, who wrote Confessions of a Sociopath, A Life Spent Hiding in Plain Sight, says, I'm an intelligent sociopath. I don't have problems with drugs. I don't commit crimes. I don't take pleasures in hurting people. And I don't typically have relationship problems. I do have a complete lack of empathy. But I consider that an advantage most of the time. Do I know the difference between right and wrong? And do I want to be good? Sure. A peaceful and orderly world is a more comfortable world for me to live in. So do I avoid breaking the law because it's right? No, I avoid breaking the law because it makes sense. Now this, this goes to a point I barely scratched in my talk with Joni. See, if they're intelligent enough, because contrary to uh, popular belief, logic will eventually lead you to the realization that unselfishness is good. (laughs) <laughs> and goodness is good. So, I mean, even even someone with no emotions, someone who's not motivated by love or empathy, should reach that realization if they're intelligent and rational enough. And it's interesting to see that even, yeah, sociopaths may realize that. Alexander McCall Smith says sociopaths are attracted to politics because they see it as a sphere in which you can be ruthless and step all over people. The fact that some politicians can tell such awful lies is another example of sociopathy. Sociopaths lie, they see nothing wrong with it. John Ronson says psychopaths make the world go around. Society is an expression of that particular sort of madness. I've always believed society to be a fundamentally rational thing. But what if it isn't? What if it's built on insanity? Stefan Molyneux says, Deep pockets and empty hearts rule the world. We unleash them at our peril. T.S. Eliot said, Half the harm that is done in this world is due to people who want to feel important. They don't mean to do harm, but the harm that they cause does not interest them. Or they do not see it, or they justify it because they are absorbed in the endless struggle to think well of themselves. And Chris Jammy offers an interesting twist uh, with religious glasses. She says, God judges men from the inside out. Men judge men from the outside in. Perhaps to God, an extreme mental patient is doing quite well in going a month without murder, for he fought his chemical imbalance and succeeded. Oppositely, perhaps the healthy, able and stable man who has never murdered in his life, yet went a lifetime consciously, willingly, never loving anyone but himself, may then be subject to harsher judgment than the extreme mental patient. It might be so that God will stand for the weak and question the strong. And Pia Spears again said, I have heard that we are spirits having a human experience. Perhaps those of us who have no conscience are dark spirits having a human experience. And that's it for today. Thanks to all my listeners who are supporting us in these harsh times. Thanks to my good helpers. I've been your host Al. Sincerely signing off. Be seeing you. Number one.